Hello and welcome to Sick Notes. My name's Ed Hope. I'm a junior doctor in the UK and on this channel I like to talk about medical things in simple terms. I thought today I'd have a go at one of these online quizzes. This one reads, you may not be a doctor but do you know your way around medical knowledge? Think you've got the prescription for a high score? Find out. Well, given my background, I'm hoping to have a high score but Generally in these kind of pub quizzes I do with my friends, I, I don't know a hell of a lot, although people think us doctors are just really intelligent at everything. Um, but I think it might be a nice thing to add maybe a little bit value to these questions and maybe um, I'm guarantee you now I won't get them all right. So you, you can play along at home, I'll leave the link to the quiz below and let's see how we get on. Which of the following was not included in the original Hippocratic Oath? So for those of you who don't know, Hippocrates, who was the kind of godfather of early medicine, a, a Greek chap, devised a set of principles, many of which we still kind of use today, and that was encased in this Hippocratic Oath where all doctors would take the oath to uphold those principles. It's now been replaced by more kind of legal frameworks. The possible answers are to always wash my hands between patients, to never attempt to induce an abortion, to never attempt to operate to remove kidney stones, to teach medicine to the sons of my teacher. Now, I don't know what the full Hippocratic Oath has, but I know the answer here. It was wouldn't have been included to always wash my hands between patients, although that is obviously super important and a key principle now to make sure we don't spread infection. Uh, the idea of germ theory, so the idea that infections are caused by viruses and bacteria so we need to clean things and sterilize things only came around in 18 something or other with uh, Louis Pasteur and there was lots of things going on at the time that made it come to fruition so one of the common stories that people talk about that backed up germ theory originally was on the maternity ward where it's found that ladies who had recently had babies were more likely to die under the care of doctors than they were under the care of midwives. People weren't quite sure how that was because doctors were kind of supposed to have more expertise. And that's because the doctors were also doing the autopsy, so looking after the people that had died during childbirth. And that meant that they were then spreading the infection from the people that died to the people that were giving birth. And so therefore spreading the infection and giving them less likely a chance of surviving. So as mad as it sounds, germ theory and the fact we wash our hands all the time is only a hundred odd years old, whereas the Hippocratic Oath is many years BC. So the answer is definitely the first one. So on to question number two, which tree does aspirin come from? Ash, beech, oak, or willow? So <laughs> is this the type of thing that people think we should know as doctors? I mean, look at the title of the thing. You may not be a doctor. Well, I am a doctor and I still don't know what that is. I mean, the first question was on ancient Greece, which I thought I did pretty good at working out. But this one is on kind of botany. Uh, I don't know. It's going to be a guess. We no doubt produce it synthetically now anyway. So clearly that's why I don't know anything about it. But I'm going to go with ash because it's ashbrin impeccable logic. Question three, what condition was the drug Viagra originally developed to treat? Well, I know this without looking at the answers. It is high blood pressure. So sildenafil or Viagra is a smooth muscle relaxant. So that was the idea that it would relax the muscles around the blood vessels and therefore reduce the blood pressure. During the drug trials, it was found that this also worked on the smooth muscle of the tissue of the corpus cavernosum. That's what fills with blood when someone has an erection. Imagine being part of that trial when uh, they sort of ask you, how was the blood pressure? Well, the blood pressure's come down a little bit and everything else. Yeah, actually, uh, my marriage is no longer on the rocks. Question number four, what is the recommended maximum daily level of salt intake in grams? Oh my word, probably something I should know. Let me try and work it out. So when people are nil by mouth, so when they're before they go into theatre and we have to replace their fluids and electrolytes, we give people one millimole per kilogram over 24 hours. So someone my weight would have 70 millimoles of 
salt. I'm gonna need a calculator. Are you allowed a calculator in this test? It doesn't say you're not, so let's go for it. So the molar mass of sodium is 23 and the molar mass of chlorine is 35. So I need to times that by 70. So that's four grams. So four grams is what people should have, but this says the maximum daily level of salt intake. So let's have a guess at double eight. Question five, why does the room start to spin when you've had too much to drink? Well, I think I know the answer to this, but I always thought it was an urban myth. So let's see if my answer is here. The alcohol affects the density of the fluid in the inner ear. This is what I've heard. The alcohol causes your brain to swell. The alcohol forces part of your brain to short circuit. The alcohol restricts the blood flow to the ears. The reason why it makes your um, the room spin, I heard, is because the alcohol... This sounds so mad, though. The alcohol um, diffuses from the bloodstream into the inner ear, and obviously because it's less dense than water, it means that the hairs in the cochlea then move more so, which means the room kind of spins a lot more. I mean, let's trust the quiz. Let's go with that. Question six, how long does an average healthy red blood cell live for? Easy answer, 120 days. So the red blood cells are what carry the oxygen around the body. They're packed, filled with haemoglobin, this kind of protein that's got iron at its core that has oxygen that binds to it. The fact they last 120 days has some clinical significance, particularly in diabetes. Sometimes it's really difficult to monitor how blood sugars are over time because at any one point, blood sugars can be different levels. So we kind of need people to take a diary. That is until scientists discovered that hemoglobin, when exposed to glucose, actually changes slightly. Therefore, we can take a blood test and look for how much of this hemoglobin has changed under the influence of glucose and therefore get an idea of how blood sugars have been managed over the last around about 120 days. What is the common name for vitamin B3? Oh, no. <laughs> so again, something I probably should know. So let's see what we do know. So thiamine, that's B1. That's important as a doctor because people can have thiamine B1 deficiency, particularly people with chronic alcohol problems. In its extreme, it can lead to something called vernicate korsakoff syndrome, a really long word, which essentially means kind of brain damage due to lack of B1. And it can be sort of semi-permanent or it can last 20 odd years. People get confusion, lack of coordination, loss of memory, things like that. So it's always important if people have alcohol history, if they come in with withdrawal and things like that, that we replace B1 intravenously. Riboflavin, that's B2, so that's not B3. I don't know why I know that. Niacin and pyridoxin, I have no idea, so it's going to be a lucky guess. I'm going to go with pyridoxin. <laughs> Question eight, where is the patella bone situated on the skull? Only kidding. It's on the leg, isn't it? It's the knee bone. Let me show you on Nina. So here's a closer look at the knee joint. It's made up of three bones. We have our thigh bone, which is the femur, which goes on to our shin bone, we call the tibia. And we have the patella, which is the kneecap that moves over the top. Not a great diagram here, because it looks like it's fused to the femur here, but it's not. It sits above, um, connected by a tendon. Question nine, what is the least common form of skin cancer? basal cell, melanomas, or squamous cells. So these are all legitimate cells of the skin. So the basal cells are the ones that sit at the bottom of the epidermis of the skin, hence their name base, basal. Squamous cell are all the kind of layered cells that go above that and protect that area. And the melanocytes that give rise to melanomas are the cells that produce melanin. So this is a kind of pigment that helps protect the skin from sunlight. The most common form of these cancers is thankfully the basal cell carcinoma. I say thankfully because I was once asked a question by a doctor, which cancer would you prefer to have if you could have any, which is seems like a really stupid and insensitive question, but has some kind of clinical relevance. Essentially what they're asking is which cancer do you are likely to catch early and is very rarely spread you'd probably go with something like a basal cell carcinoma because it tends to happen on areas where you get a lot of sunlight, so therefore you're naturally gonna see it quicker and it very rarely spreads. 
Question 10, which part of the body does an otolaryngologist specialize in? Well, we can work this out by just breaking down the word. So otto means ears. Laryn comes from the larynx, which is the kind of specialist area that protects your windpipe. So it has your vocal cords in, so we can talk and phonate as I am now. And it also contains the epiglottis, which covers up the windpipe when you swallow. So it stops any food um, going down the windpipe and making you choke. And ologist just means a specialist. So otolaryngologist is gonna be ear, nose, and throat. So I'm halfway through the quiz, no idea how I'm getting on. Hopefully though, you guys are learning something as we go through. Question 11, which dangerous infectious disease has been extinct in the wild since the late 1970s? Diphtheria, leprosy, smallpox, tuberculosis. I don't like the fact they've put in the wild there to kind of sort of suggest it may not really be extinct. I think the answer is smallpox, isn't it? I kind of heard this again. Maybe it's an urban rumor that there's only two vials of it that exist, one in America and one in China. And I heard it was to do with kind of if there was ever kind of bio, biological warfare. I hope that's not why. Maybe it's just in case we ever need to use it in some kind of research. But I think it's smallpox. On to question 12. Which of the following diseases is not hereditary or genetic? Cystic fibrosis, Huntington's disease, mononucleosis, thalassemia. So cystic fibrosis is autosomal recessive. So an inherited condition that means you need two of the faulty genes, one from each parent to get the symptoms. It causes thickened secretions throughout the body, worse in the respiratory tract, so affecting the lungs, so you can't clear all the natural mucus that you produce, the digestive system, particularly the pancreas, and also the reproductive system. In its extreme, it can be a really debilitating and life-limiting condition, mainly because the respiratory problems, people need frequent chest physio and oxygen and just the kind of metabolic demand as well to keep all that breathing up means they have a high calorie intake and things like this. It's a really nasty disease. Huntington's disease is also a really nasty condition. It's autosomal dominant, which means you just need one of the faulty genes to have the symptoms. So therefore only one of your parents needs to have the faulty gene. So it's generally known about in the family. It leads to neurological problems because it affects the central nervous system initially can cause problems with coordination but this progresses quite quickly actually and can lead to cognitive impairment like confusion and problems with movement um, there's no cure for it so from diagnosis you the life expectancy is only around about 20 years. Thalassemias are often autosomal recessive, but they can have other funny things that are going on. These are conditions that affect the hemoglobin of the blood, so people become anemic. They often require um, blood transfusions to correct this. Mononucleosis is an infective condition, so this is caused by the Epstein-Barr virus. You may have heard of uh, mono infective mononucleosis as the kissing disease or glandular fever. So you're uh, not going to get it from your parents unless you've been French kissing them. Question 13. What is the definition of congestive heart failure? The death of heart tissues caused by a blockage of the blood supply. So that's the definition of a heart attack, a myocardial infarction. Myo meaning muscle, cardial meaning heart, and infarction meaning death of tissue due to lack of blood supply. So myocardial infarction quite literally means death of part of the heart muscle due to lack of blood supply as defined here. So that's not congestive car cardiac failure, but it can lead to that. An abnormal heartbeat preventing one of the heart chambers from fully contracting. So we call this an arrhythmia. So that's not that. A, a slow heartbeat often caused by a problem with the heart's electrical system. Again, we call this arrhythmia, but a slow heartbeat we'd call a brady arrhythmia, of which there are many causes. And the last one, so it must be this last one, the failure of the heart to remove enough blood from the veins. Yeah, I guess. It's a kind of woolly definition of heart failure, so it actually means the inability for the heart to meet the demands of the body, but that can lead to congestion, so I'm guessing uh, it's close enough. Question 14, which of the following anxiety disorders is a fear of failure? <laughs> It's quite a pertinent question when you've got a doctor answering a online medical trivia quiz. Um, I think I've got a fear of failure of pronouncing some of these. Let's see if we get on. 
acrophobia, caracophyophobia, nosemophobia, or pyrophobia? I have no idea. What I would say, this is a tip for anyone sitting any exam. Here we are. Get, get your pen and paper out to write this down. In an exam, if you're never sure which one to go for, pick the longest answer. I always kind of thought, why would they put in such a long answer if it wasn't the right answer? And definitely pick it if it means the answer goes on to a different line in the kind of question, not in the case here. But, you know, whenever you're guessing, that is always <laughs> the last option. Question 15, which of the following discoveries happened most recently? First type of contact lens, first open heart surgery, laser eye surgery, measles vaccine. Blimey. The laser eye surgery has got to be quite recent. Question 16, what is referred to in the term good cholesterol? I know this one, it's HDL, high density lipoprotein. Let's go for that one. Question 17, gout is a form of which illness? It's almost like I've sponsored this question. The real dedicated among you may have watched my video on gout already. So if you haven't, check it out up there and I talk about all about it. A lot of people think it's just some kind of disease that kind of pirates get, but it's actually really common. So gout is a form of arthritis. Arth coming from articulate, so your joints, and itis meaning inflammation. So arthritis means inflammation in the joint, and in gout you get buildup of uric acid. This precipitates into the joint space, into the synovial fluid, and forms crystals, so really sharp, jagged crystals. So as you move your joint, it's supposed to be lovely and lubricated, it's really sharp, and imagine how painful that is, so the joint becomes red, hot, and swollen. Question 18, how many people have been estimated to have died from AIDS since it was first recognized in 1981 to January 2006? Well, all of these are in the sort of tens of millions, so it was a kind of real major public health issue. Thankfully, though, a lot of people don't realize this, that HIV and AIDS is not the disease it once was. Although we can't cure it, life expectancy now for people with HIV, if it's well managed, have the same life expectancy as everyone else. Pretty good, huh? I don't know which one to go for. I'm going to pick the lowest number, but even 15 million, that's like a quarter of the population of the UK. So, you know, huge, devastating illness at its height. <coughs> So just two questions left before I find out what I know as a doctor. Question 19, what effect does the hormone oxytocin have? Well, I know this already. It's one of the only examples of a positive feedback system in the body. If you want to know what that is, give it a Google. But it stimulates milk production and uterine contractions. Very important during labour. So last question, and I can find out if my medical degree has helped me a lot on this medical trivia quiz. Question 20. Whose was quoted as saying whose, surely should that, that should be who. So this is my get out of jail now. If uh, I don't do very well, I can just blame the person's spelling. Who was quoted as saying hospitals are only an intermediate stage of civilization? No idea. Doctor Who, <laughs> Florence Nightingale, Hippocrates, Sanjay Gupta, the Surgeon General. Quite a mismatch of people here. I'm going to go with... I have no idea who it is. I'm going to go with Sanjay Gupta, the Surgeon General, purely because it's the longest name. So how did I do? So I got Medical Master. That's right. Hang on. Well, almost. <laughs> Things were going so well. You were heading for the top spot. This pretty much sums up my career. What happened? You are always being told that we learn something new every day. So perhaps if you retake the quiz in a few days time, you'll get all the questions right. Oh no. So obviously got a few wrong. L let's be honest here. None of this stuff would really help you be a doctor. It's not like when I give someone an aspirin, I have to go out and figure out <laughs> which tree to chop down. So I'm gonna spend the next few hours going through all my wrong answers and plug the gaps in my knowledge anyway. I hope you found this video mildly entertaining, hopefully a little bit educational, maybe that's pushing it actually. Thank you so much for watching as always. And again, just being part of this new studio and Sick Notes community. 
as always, I really appreciate everything. I'll keep trying to make interesting and mildly educational content as much as I can. So until next time, goodbye. Thank <music> you.